Good evening, everyone. My name is Hade Gay, and I am currently a third year's master's voice student here at the Shepherd School of Music. I am serving as the Muse coordinator for this year's Muse series, and I am incredibly excited to present to you all our esteemed guest, Aaron Dworkin. To familiarize you all a bit more with who he is, I'd like to read his bio. Here it is. Named a 2005 MacArthur Fellow, President Obama's first appointment to the National Council on the Arts and a member of President Biden's Arts Policy Committee, Aaron P. Dworkin served as Dean of the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, alternatively known as SMTD. He is currently a tenured full professor of arts leadership and entrepreneurship at SMTD, in addition to serving as a professor of entrepreneurial studies at the Stephen M. Ross School of Business. Aaron is a successful social entrepreneur, having founded the Sphinx Organization, the leading arts organization focused on diversity. He also serves as host of the nationally broadcast Arts Engine Show in collaboration with Detroit Public Television. Aaron is a best-selling writer, having authored The Entrepreneurial Artist, Lessons from Highly Successful Creatives, published by Roman and Littlefield, a science fiction novel, Ethos, Rise of Malcolm, published by Morgan James, as well as his memoir titled Uncommon Rhythm, A Black, White, Jewish, Jehovah's Witness, Irish Catholic Adoptee's Journey to Leadership, released through Aquarius Press, a poetry collection, they said I wasn't really black, and a children's book, The First Adventure of Chili Peppers. Aaron is a prominent spoken word performing artist with a current national tour of his American Rhapsody with a national consortium of orchestras and premiered with the Minnesota Orchestra. He has collaborated with Yo-Yo Ma, Damien Sneed, Anna Devere Smith, Damien Wetzel, Lil Buck, and others. Aaron is also an Emmy Award winning filmmaker, having produced and directed three films, including An American Prophecy, the Liberation, and The Book of Aaron, in addition to recording and producing two CDs entitled Ebony Rhythm and Bar Talk. His visual digital art project, Fractured History, has been exhibited at multiple galleries and museums to rave reviews. Aaron has been featured in People Magazine, on NBC's Today Show and Nightly News, CNN, NPR, and others. He is a frequent keynote speaker and lecturer at numerous national and global arts conferences and serves as a board or advisory member for numerous influential arts organizations, including the National Council on the Arts, Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, the Avery Fisher Artist Program, and others. It is once again such an honor to have him here with us this evening. And on behalf of the Shepherd School of Music and the Muse Task Force, thank you, Aaron, for joining us. And thank you for all who are here with us. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hadi. And hopefully I can live up to uh, that uh, introduction. Um, and I am just uh, glad to be able to spend uh, you know, this time together. Uh, and so I'm gonna kind of share a presentation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background, my history, because I think that is so critical to inform ourselves as artists, as practitioners, and as arts leaders. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some different, you know, best practices, aspects that I think are really important and woven into all of that will of course be um, themes related to diversity, uh, to innovation, um, to creativity, and of course, to entrepreneurship, which I think these entrepreneurial skill sets are really so important. So I'm going to try and share a fair amount of information. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly because I'd love to be able to get to some Q&A um, and really see if there's some very specific aspects or areas that I might be able to respond to. Uh, so with that, I'm going to just uh, start sharing my screen uh, and uh, let me just do that. All right. Uh, great. So there we go. So I just wanted to uh, begin with a little bit of music. I think it's always critically important.
So obviously it's really right, the joy uh, of my life to be able to work with so many amazing young people like Hannah uh, and others, both in a performance aspect, but then also those who are looking at administrative leadership and entrepreneurial leadership in addition to or separate from their various performance aspirations. So I mentioned that I was gonna share some of my background. So I will start at the very beginning. Uh, and I was born, my birthday is coming up very soon. I was born on 9-11, on September 11th, uh, but I was immediately given up for adoption. And I was adopted by a white Jewish couple uh, who were neuroscientists and behavioral scientists who already had a birth son, my older brother. Uh, who's now a cellular biologist uh, and biogeneticist at Columbia. Fast forward 31 years, I was reunited with my birth parents, my birth father, who's Black Jehovah's Witness, my birth mother, who's white Irish Catholic, who, after giving me up for adoption, ended up getting back together three years later, ultimately getting married and having another child, my full sister, who they did raise, Maddie, who practices law in New York, and we're extraordinarily close. So basically, in the end, I'm a Black, White, Jewish, Irish, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness who grew up with a big Afro playing the violin. So no big surprise, and this goes to write that what we do, especially as artists, needs to emanate from us. Themes of diversity, given that I'm a whole bunch of things wrapped up into one, uh, it has always been a theme and a part of my life, unintentionally as I was younger, and then more intentionally, the older I got and the more I began to think about architecting a career trajectory, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. So early on, I <clears throat> started playing the violin when I was five. I was kind of really motivated by my adoptive mother, who was an amateur violinist. And when I was five years old, uh, listening to the uh, you know Mil Nathan Milstein recordings of the unaccompanied box, she became really re-inspired. And that inspired me to really be able to start. And I was very, very lucky early on to have phenomenal teaching. My first teacher was Vladimir Grafman, um, who was the you know, amazing teacher who brought the Russian School of Teaching over to the States, taught Joseph Gingold, who of course taught many uh, of our stars uh, that, we, uh, that we're able to see today, like Joshua Bell and others. So I was really able to access phenomenal teaching at an early stage. And also you'll see from these pictures, I played chamber music. Um, beginning very early on. And for me, that was extraordinary because it was this way to connect with others. Um, and so whether it was at the 92nd Street Y in New York or other circumstances, I was able to continue progressing on my instrument. Ultimately to the Interlochen Arts Academy, uh, which is where I spent my junior and senior years of high school. Um, and again, had this opportunity uh, to be able to think about how I could speak with my instrument. That continued on initially to Penn State, where I was concertmaster of the Penn State Philharmonic um, and exploring. And then um, I ended up having to leave Penn State uh, because uh, I had a kind of, you know, falling out, shall we say, with my parents and, uh, and times were pretty tough. I was unable to, to stay in school and that led to four years off from school. And I wanted to share this brief moment in time for, for several reasons. Because sometimes, whether it's life circumstances or our own choices, correct choices or incorrect choices, we may end up having atypical career paths, including our, the career path of our education. And so I left after two years from Penn State and led to four years off. But during those four years, of uh, which I had you know, significant you know, financial issues, was poverty stricken, et cetera. But I got a lot of entrepreneurial experience and work experience that was really valuable. And one of the things that happened was I was actually close to being homeless uh, during that time period. And for a while I had a friend who was homeless who stayed with me. So the issue was very important. So then when I kind of finally landed in Ann Arbor, I felt very passionate about this issue of homelessness and felt I could contribute, even though I had no car, I had no resources, right? But I felt like I had a great idea 
that if put into place could really make a difference. And so I launched a homeless organization. Um, and lo and behold, things did not pan out. But as I was trying desperately to try to find support, one of the people that I reached out to to try and support the organization was Robin Williams. I had no connections or contacts, but I was like, you know, let me reach out. He had done this amazing initiative called Comic Relief using comedy to support homelessness. I thought maybe he might care, All right? So I reach out, don't hear anything right away. Organization, you know, falters. Unfortunately, it has to fold. Uh, you know, I get a job in the mailroom of a local marketing company just trying to make ends meet, and the phone rings. And uh, and and a woman on the other line says, this is Marsha Williams. I'm calling about a letter to my husband. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Marsha Williams' wife uh, at the time. And this led to a long conversation. And of course, the very first thing I had to do was share that what I had written them about had failed. I had to share about my failures. And of course, this is a theme in entrepreneurship and all leadership, your ability to understand failure and to admit it, um, to be authentic about it, and to learn from your failures and how to move forward. So anyway, after sharing that, she's like, well, what are you going to do? What are you doing? I'm like, well, you know, trying to work, but really, I just wanted to try and get back to school. I wanted to get back to my violin, but I, all my, you know, loans to Penn State were in default. My federal loans were in default. I couldn't get transcripts to even be able to apply to the University of Michigan. So she says, you know, why don't you send us copies of your student loans and we'll see if there's some way we can help. So of course, you know, I said I had done a full recital in my sophomore year. I sent a copy of my recital. I, you know, I had done Beethoven Violin Concerto. I had already started writing poetry. I sent poetry and of course, copies of the student loans, did all of that. Meanwhile, times were so hard, got evicted, had to move into a new apartment. Finally, you know, got settled in this new job in, in the mail room of a marketing company. A couple months later, letter comes in the mail from Joel Faden Financial Companies. And enclosed, there's just a simple sheet. It says, enclosed, please find checks made out in your behalf from Robin Williams' account. And they had caught all of my, they had paid off all of my student loans to Penn State, freeing up my transcripts, and they had caught all of my federal loans up out of default. So someone who didn't know me at all, no connections, no networking in, you know, made a profound difference. And because of that support, I was able to return to the University of Michigan and to my studies where I ultimately not only got my bachelor's, got my master's. And it was while I was at Michigan that I walked into a lesson one day and told my teacher, I've got this idea, right? So that theme of entrepreneurship was continuing. Now, I just was realizing really for the first time in my life, thinking about the fact that I go to a major orchestra concert. I don't see people of color on stage or in the audience. Um, I walk into a lesson one day. My teacher says, do you want to play music by Black composers? And I didn't know there were any Black composers. As a biracial, multiracial, viewed by America as a Black violinist, I did not know there were any Black classical composers until that moment in my lesson. And asking myself why and thinking, what if, what if there was a competition for young Black and Latinx musicians come together, play this music by composers of color, play at the highest level, gain resources to be able to access the top summer music programs, high quality teaching, and through that be able to build professional careers, right? A relatively simple idea. And I literally came into my lesson one day with that. And so I think about, because this is really important, what if I never went to Interlochen? or to Penn State, or to Michigan, right? These are educational institutions that valued my diversity, my recruitment. And so I encourage you, when you think about Rice, Shepherd, right? When you think about any of the institutions that surround you, how can you utilize the extraordinary resources that are available so that you can help build and move forward your own career trajectory? Really critically, critically important. So as I was thinking about this issue of diversity in classical music, right, you can't just have a dream as an entrepreneur and then just be like, okay, I'm just going to do this dream, right? There's the equivalent of scales, right? So as I even started working on Sphinx, I started viewing Sphinx like my primary instrument. What are the scales? What are my etudes, right? When do I get to get on stage and perform? What does chamber music look like, right? So all of these things, collaborating with others, 
fundraising, right? All of these things. And also a core part of that is research, knowing and understanding the issue, right? It's like playing a piece, but not knowing about the composer, the context of their nationality, the time period in which they wrote the piece. What were they trying to evoke? What was their intention, right? Whether you want to fully convey that as an interpreter, or if you potentially want to re-envision that original um, creativity born out of the composer. So I was thinking about organizationally, what do these issues of diversity in classical music mean and what are they? What are the realities? So I'm gonna run through a fair number of just some quick stats here, just to give you a sense of what diversity in the arts looks like, because unfortunately we do have a lot of work to go. So no big surprise, a little less than 2% uh, or in major orchestras, 2% are black, a little over 2% are Latinx, uh, Asians are about 7%, right? So it gives us again, an initial thing, but we wanna look a little deeper. So we wanna look at other positions. So when we look at music directors, conductors, about similar, 2% black, 2% Latinx. When we look at executive directors, right? The administrative leadership of orchestras, less than half of 1% are black, less than 1% Latinx, artistic administrators. So across all of America's orchestras, 0% of artistic administrators are black or Latinx. Even if we look at education and community relations directors, here still, it's only about 3% black, 2% Latinx. So obviously, right, this isn't something where, well, it would be nice if we could, you know, uh, increase this a little bit incrementally, right? We have a lot of work to do to build true representation in our field. So another additional snapshot, right? Let's look at programming. Where's our music coming from? No big surprise if we look at the top 10 composers, 0% are Black and Latinx, but we also perform relatively few North American composers. So I thought it's important, let's just pull out only the North American composers just so we can see where we're at. Even if we pull out that subset, it is still 0% our Black or Latinx. So if we had as a programming milestone to have just 1% of the works performed by American orchestras to be by any composer of color, we have yet to reach that mark. Now I will say this because times are very optimistic that in this past year and in this upcoming season, depending on how things turn out with performing and COVID, that we may make probably arguably the largest leap we have ever made, certainly in my lifetime. So even though some of these statistics are sobering, I am optimistic. And what I think about is numbers are not just numbers, right? Each one of them is a story. And so what if these numbers, what if the stories were different? I love this quote from Chimamanda Adichie, a famed Nigerian author. I encourage you to read and or watch uh, her TED talk. But she talks about the danger of a single story is not that it is untrue, but that it is incomplete. The stories that we weave in the arts are incomplete. By definition, factually, we can see the statistics and also we know that anecdotally. And we can see that from the stories that we weave. So what I wanted to do was share a little of this background of Sphinx so you can get a sense of this part of the work that I have done uh, in the past and continue to do, but more in a supportive role. Uh, for the past six years. Uh, instead of just kind of talk at you about that, uh, I've got about a three minute video that I'm gonna share with you that will give you that overview of Sphinx and this work that we do. perception that the talent isn't out there within communities of color is so deeply false in classical music. Wow, drop the mic. There are millions of kids like this in this country who do not have the resources to become everything that they could be. But fortunately, these programs are doing the job that the bigger society fails to do. Sphinx's mission is transforming lives through the power of diversity in the arts. And we address the issue of lack of diversity and inclusion through a sense of a pipeline. We have Overture program replace violins in the hands of young people for the first time. I definitely believe that the Sphinx Overture program has made a difference in this community. 
The Sphinx Competition is our flagship program. It's a wholesome approach to musician development that goes beyond the competitive mechanism. Sphinx Connect is the epicenter for artists and leaders in diversity devoted to the issues of inclusion, leadership, and career advancement. We have Sphinx Symphony, which is a professional, all African-American and Latino orchestra. And then we have the Sphinx Virtuosi, which is an ensemble of soloists that performs across the country, everywhere from Carnegie Hall to Harris Theater in Chicago, and really communities beyond. I think the Sphinx organization is so incredibly important. It tries to achieve in our society an equilibrium of people who are incredibly talented, and motivated to be part of every aspect of our society. Sphinx has done tremendous work over its first 20 years. And I think that over the next 20 years, Sphinx will truly transform the lives of millions of more people. So again, I wanted to just be able to, again, give you this kind of sense of the work that Sphinx does. Um, and in addition to what you saw in the video, Sphinx does work in the administrative realm as well. So as Sphinx Lead, which is developing the artistic administrators and next generation of presidents of orchestras and deans of colleges, universities, et cetera, and also in the entrepreneurial area with Sphinx Tank. Uh, and so we have a competitive process each year that identifies the leading arts entrepreneurs and Am I, am I back on there? Sorry about that, everyone. I don't know how I got uh, dropped there. So it looks like I am back on. So let me just continue to share and here we go. Okay, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, and so a key to building creative careers, being able to respond to technical glitches as they occur and to respond and adapt. Uh, as I like to say, improvising. So very, very important. Uh, so, but to talk about building a creative career, um, I think there are just kind of a few, if you will, best practices that I wanted to share with you. And one of them is being innovative. One of my favorite quotes is from Brene Brown, key organizational leader. And what she talks about is, there is no innovation in creativity without failure 
period. And just as I was talking about needing to share when I tried to start that the homeless organization and ostensibly failed, even though there's so much that I learned, you want to be able to embrace failure because chances are, if you have not failed, you have not been innovating. It is just impossible without it. So you wanna be able to think about that and that role of failure in innovation. Writing, writing is absolutely key. You have to be able to articulate your vision, your ideas, your innovation through the written word. If you're gonna be able to bring together the partners who will help you make it happen, and of course, be able to garner the resources and especially do any fundraising to support it as well. And then just kind of this over idea, uh, overarching idea of being an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, right? What does that look like? So in Michigan, we have what we refer to as Excel, our excellence in entrepreneurship, career empowerment and leadership. But there's these basic components, right? We've got coursework and we're dealing with, you know, developing the mindset, ideation, grant writing, public speaking, all these types of things. We bring in some people for a leadership forum, all those types of things. Then we have these regular workshops, right? So we bring in key leaders so students are able to workshop with them. They're able to develop mentors and identify role models. Um, and then of course, a key thing is advising, right? We need to be able to provide that one-on-one -on -one specific support for a specific student's ideas and then be able to do research. You see networking cutting across all of these. It is impossible to develop a creative career path if you do not network. Unfortunately, being good enough on your instrument is not enough. Being smart enough or even innovative enough is not enough. You need to be able to network with those who will be able to help you. You cannot just simply be a singular individual and be successful in this career path. And then finally, we have direct grants because we're like, right, if we empower and do all this empowerment for students, if we don't actually provide them with some seed funding, then unfortunately, we may be just setting them up to fail. So we need to be able to provide that as well. Um, and another aspect, this was a project that I worked on to try to be able to bring together kind of these case studies, right? So we put together this book that are really these case studies of entrepreneurial artists and to be able to provide a breadth of that. So whether it's musical theater, we've got Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, for regular theater, Jeff Daniels for jazz, Wynton Marsalis for country music, right? Lee Greenwood, uh, dance, Bill T. Jones, et cetera, right? The list goes on and on. But the idea was, what I did was I actually interviewed each of these people and then captured in their own chapter, their experiences, their life, you know, their life's work as an entrepreneurial artist. And then at the end, coalesce that into entrepreneurship best practices that we're able to learn from them. So uh, I love quotes, as you're probably getting to see. So another quote that I love is from Albert Einstein, who said, strive not to be a success, but rather to be of value. When you have that focus on how can I develop these skill sets now when I'm surrounded by an institution that's dedicated to my education, to my training, how can I build my skill sets to be better of value? And then this other quote that I love from Aristotle, Sphinx has a, a wonderful uh, celebratory uh, event uh, that's hosted at the Supreme Court each year um, uh, and with Justice Sotomayor. And, um, and I share this quote from Aristotle about excellence. And he said that excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have those because we have acted rightly. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And that's what I talk about. We shouldn't bring excellence because we have an audition, because we've got a final exam, because we're preparing for jurors, juries, whatever it might be. We must have excellence be a habit in our lives. And it is only then that we truly will bring that trait out. So again, these kind of components of entrepreneurship. And then finally related to a creative career, I want to talk about portfolio life, a portfolio career. Because basically these days, this is what is required. You kind of can't really just do one thing. And the people that I find who are not only most quote unquote successful, but more importantly, feel most fulfilled in their creative career are those who have a portfolio life, right? Just like a financial portfolio, they have different components to what they do. Some they might have a, 
performance por uh, part of their portfolio, and then they might have a teaching part of their portfolio. They might have an administrative part of their portfolio and, admin and entrepreneurial, et cetera. So what I wanted to do is just quickly share with you what my portfolio life is. So in other words, this isn't just something kind of textbook, you know, we understand from best practices, one should intentionally craft a portfolio life. Um, but yes, you should, and ideally not fall into one, but rather architect one. And that is what I do. So I do that and I think very intentionally about what I'm going to do, what the time periods are that are required, and also where does compensation come from? There are parts of my portfolio life that don't bring any compensation. On the contrary, they actually require um, the expenditure of funds, but they are important to me. They bring value to me for different reasons. So I have some things, right, that are, of course, major priorities in terms of time, all of those types of things. So, right, look at my portfolio life. My main role, right, is as a professor at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance at Michigan, right? I also have a courtesy appointment at our business school, Michigan Ross. I also do advising for the Sphinx organization. I'm also a writer, as was mentioned. I have a, a, a science fiction book. I also do performing my American Rhapsody, which is my spoken word piece that I do with orchestras. I do, of course, presenting and speaking, such as this. Uh, I also have board service, so I serve on the National Council uh, for the Arts, which oversees the National Endowment for the Arts. I do some personal philanthropy through the Dworkin Foundation, actually involved in digital assets and cryptocurrencies, a very fun, uh, exciting uh, endeavor uh, through Maverick Analytics. Uh, again, board work, I'm on the board of the Michigan Theater, Chamber Music America, the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation. And then I also do some visual art. Uh, so I have various um, visual art exhibits that I do. Uh, this is one of my pieces, uh, part of my exhibit called Fractured History. I take prominent African-Americans throughout history and embed them in instruments and then have them speak through that. This is Coretta Scott King uh, that you see um, in this piece. Uh, and then of course, writing my book, The Entrepreneurial Artist. And then also I'm a filmmaker uh, and was mentioned, I just recently, we got an Emmy for American Prophecy and just had its live in-person uh, premiere uh, at the Michigan Theater. So this is, if you will, that snapshot of my portfolio life. And here's the key thing I wanna share. It's very intentionally architected in terms of the time and the nature of all of these components. And so I encourage you right now as a student, could be a, you know, um, at any point in your career trajectory, I encourage you to be intentional about your portfolio life. Oh, and so sorry that I forgot to mention Arts Engines, my weekly show. Uh, and I encourage you to check out, uh, comes out Saturdays on Facebook, a host of other um, uh, uh, social media platforms as well. We actually are up to 100,000 viewers. Um, and I also have an additional show, Artful Science. So my hope is that my story will encourage each and every one of you in your role to act, right? To throw the dice, to think about these components. And as you do that, feel free to connect with me. My direct email, maverickviolin at gmail.com. I'm also on all you know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. So I encourage you to touch base um, as you're uh, continuing on your career path. And anything that I can do to be helpful or supportive, please do let me know. As all of the amazing faculty who are there, right? our lives are dedicated to supporting and improving and helping you build the foundation for your lives. That is what brings us joy um, and, and makes us feel so fulfilled at the end of every day, at the end of a week, a month, or a year. So imagine a future if you were the one who could determine if these things happen because you are. No one else can for you. And I think about what if you choose to experience this speech a little bit differently and evolve how you value diversity and what it means to you because diversity does not mean and does not need to mean the same thing to every person. And ultimately, what if you take what are just words that I can share during this presentation with you, but actually make them tangible in your own life? I wanted to share this final quote. As I mentioned, I love quotes with you. But before that, these are a couple pictures of Martin Luther King uh, Jr. and Coretta and their children. You know, they grew up with a piano um, in the house. And there's Coretta and, and Bernice uh, playing. And, you know, uh, Martin and Coretta met at a music school. They met at NEC, at the New England Conservatory of Music. Um, and so music 
was a huge part of their lives. Um, and this kind of became very poignant for me because you'll see Patrice uh, Jackson, who's in the lower corner there playing cello. And we were at a philanthropy conference in Atlanta and Patrice was performing and Coretta Scott King was there. And she came up to me afterwards, tears in her eyes. Obviously the performance was extraordinarily moving. And she shared with me this important role that the arts had in their lives in the movement for social justice. And when you think about what it is that you wanna do in our field, performing, administrating, being an entrepreneur, I encourage you to keep in mind the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability but comes through continuous struggle. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period was not the strident clamor of the bad people but the appalling silence of the good people. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And I submit to you this role that we all play in the arts matters and matters more than ever in an ever kind of divisive country in an ever divisive world. This art form, this medium that we have power and control over because of the crafts that we have developed to utilize it, to tell our short stories is so incredibly, incredibly important. And so I encourage you to kind of keep that in mind as you think about this work that we do. And with that, I will pause and I would love to be able to engage in Q&A. Yes, um, thank you so much, Erin, for that powerful presentation. Uh, we will now be transitioning to the Q&A segment of tonight's lecture. Um, so if there's anyone who has any questions they'd like to ask, you can type them in the chat, or if you would like to speak with Aaron directly, please click on the ask a question button and we will make you a panelist so that the two of you can chat. Don't be shy, y'all. It's okay. <laughs> he doesn't back. Exactly. <laughs> and in, my, in my classes, I'm not able to do it in this webinar format. In my classes, when students are a little bit hesitant to initially start asking questions, I say, okay, well, I'm going to start asking all of you questions. And then the questions start flowing very quickly. So. Um, so we do have a question from Kurt. Thank you so much, Kurt. Um, and Kurt asks, um, what were the greatest challenges you faced when starting Sphinx? Uh, so it's such a great question. And, um, you know, there, there are a myriad. So first thing I would say about challenges and whatever it is that you're initially trying to work on, which is the idea of persistence. In other words, that no matter what it is that you do, you're going to do, you're going to experience challenges. And so it's, are you equipped to respond to that? Are you equipped to be persistent? Um, are you gonna be resilient against those obstacles that come? So one is just a generalized thing to say that you must bring persistence and resilience no matter what those obstacles are. Um, for me, there certainly was, and pretty much anytime you're building a nonprofit, if you don't encounter financial fundraising challenges, then either somehow you're very uniquely oddly blessed uh, or something happened, you had an initial angel donor. Um, so, but certainly fundraising uh, is always a challenge, especially early on. Um, and, and I would say in that building a board, right? A board who are going to bring experience, networks and money and resources to the work that you're doing. That can be very difficult. Um, and then one other thing that, that I would say was kind of a challenge, but not because I, I felt so committed to the idea, which was that there were many people, including people of color, who said, I, I either couldn't do it or I shouldn't do the project. Um, they're like, you know, there a number of people said, there really aren't musicians of color of this level of talent out there. 
And so you, even if you're successful, which you won't be, you will create a high profile platform for musicians who can't play at a competitive level, right? I don't hear that anymore, but 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, unfortunately I did hear that. And I knew it was different because I knew I could play and I knew I was not the best black violinist in the country, right? So I'm like, I know if I can hold my own and play at a competitive level, then, and I'm not the only one, then it's about all of these other aspects that relate to networking, resources, the ability to have an instrument that you can play on to really win auditions with, access to you know, great top summer music programs, access to the top music schools, um, right? It's, there's a host of other additional criteria and factors that go into who ultimately is successful in our field. And I realized that I could make a big difference by focusing on those. Thank you. Um, there are so many wonderful questions. Oh my goodness, um, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, so there is a question from Miss Jones. Uh, how do you maintain your creative integrity while you are bound to the structures and rules of the institution? <laughs> ah, so that's a so it's a great question. Um, you know, um, so I would say two things. I'll describe two aspects. So one, um, being a tenured faculty member, uh, I. I don't feel very many um, programmatic curricular restrictions. Um, and if I did, I'd probably push against them pretty hard. Um, I feel like I'm able to teach um, what I feel and believe needs to be taught and teach it in a way that I believe and that I can see and evaluate is effective and communicates the material in a way that's highly impactful for um, my students, um, but I'm very, very vigilant to the evaluations from my students so that I'm always able to be continually improving what I, what I do. Um, now, with that said, there are many, uh, you know, areas where you're not in a tenured role and or where you don't have that type of, of, of freedom or flexibility in terms of an institution. Um, and, um, and what I would say is that this is where collaboration and the ability to articulate the change that you want to see to others. So for example, if I'm at a bid institution and I see this, you know, I either want to do something creatively and there's the institutions pushing back, or I see things the institution is doing or not doing that I wish could change. If I just as an individual kind of, you know, just stand out and say, you know what, either that's wrong or I want to be able to do this or, you know, and potentially, you know, kind of rail against some of the powers that be, I'm probably not going to be too successful. And even if I am successful, it's probably going to be short lived. So how I would approach that is look and say, who else feels similarly? And I do that for two reasons. One is because I want to make sure I'm not alone because then I may not be right. If I'm the only person that feels this way in my institution, the very first thing I ask myself is, am I right? Is it possible I'm wrong? Because either I'm right and all of the other 10 dozens or hundreds of people at this institution are wrong, or there's maybe something I'm missing. So that's first. Then ideally, right, you find some other like-minded people and now say, how can we collaborate? Because all of a sudden it's a much more powerful voice. Tenure or no tenure, you get a significant group of people, including a significant group of students, you can create extraordinary change in an institution because institutions tend to fear kind of, you know, group uprisings. I don't want to start anything <laughs> at Rice or Shepherd, but just to say that when you get a group of, of uh, or a collection of people, and then the final component, which is when you then are talking with the powers that be or however the decision-making structures are, now you need to be able to make the case. You need to be able to. So you have to be able to articulate verbally and often in written form why whatever that change is that you wanna do creatively, what you wanna do, why it matters, why it's important, why it won't bring about whatever fears are that the institution has, you've gotta make the case. So I'd say individually figure out, identify people you might be able to collaborate with and then be able to make the case. Great question. 
Thank you so much. And now um, I would, we're moving on to Margaret's question, which is, um, do you see a need for classical music itself to evolve as a way to become more inclusive, specifically a broader scope of styles presented in concerts and recitals that are recognized as quote unquote, excuse me, quote worthy, unquote. <laughs> um, so my short answer would be yes. Uh, I, I love not being able to you know, be a politician who they often talk around answers. So yes, I do think that is great. Um, Sphinx's programming often will begin to incorporate uh, different styles. And I think also this is something that happens very naturally when you bring a diverse group of composers involved in a particular initiative. When you have composers, they're often, if they're given that freedom, to be able to bring many things from their own um, historical, you know, background or cultural background. Um, so where you have, you know, typical historical, you know, classical composers that we might play all the time, who at the time may have brought folk themes or idioms from their culture that now are viewed as kind of straight up classical music. Now, all of a sudden, if a contemporary, say, African American composer does the same thing, somehow it's seen by some as you know, divergent from classical music, et cetera. So of course, I think that's that's silly um, and, and quite narrow-minded and narrow-framed and no art form remains static. All art forms evolve over history. You can track that. Um, and in some ways that's how they really thrive. And so I think classical music will thrive on that. And that gets to this idea of excellence. I would say, don't ever let anyone tell you that, well, this very, very small subset, you know, of Western European white, you know, classical composers, this is excellent classical music and everything else is additive, maybe nice to do in mid January or February, right, or that kind of thing. Um, I encourage you to um, reject that definition of excellence. And what I will often say to orchestras is, if your definition of excellence, if your goal is to perform the best composed music by white European composers during this particular time frame to a largely white affluent audience, you are excellent. You are doing a phenomenal job at that. But if your goal or your mission is to perform excellent classical music, excellent orchestral music to the wide diverse audience that is your broader community, then it's potent possible that you're failing at that. And then we should look at what your definition of excellence is. All right, thank you so much again. Um, next, uh, this, uh, oh, excuse me. Oh yes, Rachel, I believe this person's name is Rachel, um, asked, I was particularly interested in a small thing you said, I'm not quoting exactly, that the Sphinx program is not focused on Sphinx. Could you speak more about how you create a, a supportive, exciting arts environment that has high standards, but doesn't put competition first? Ah, yeah, so, well, so it's, it's great that you raised that. Thank you so much for the question. <clears throat> because it's interesting that, you know, Sphinx originally emanated as a competition. The competition is certainly one of its flagship programs. Um, but I was one of those musicians and violinists when I founded Sphinx that hated competitions. Um, and and the, there was a specific reason, which is why from the get-go that Sphinx was designed separate from the focus on diversity, unlike most competition, right? You come, you compete, you either get to the next round or not, and you leave. And then you get to the final round and you win and that's it. And then maybe then you get signed and then you go off and perform with orchestras. I didn't like that at all. It didn't build any obviously sense of community. And also there was a lot of politics involved with the juries and there was some secretive decision makings and things like that. So I wanted to have an open jury process, an open um, process in terms of their, their deliberations, their, their ultimate adjudications, um, and to be able to build a community. So several things that came out of that. One that every jury member for the Sphinx competition is required to provide a page of jury comments. So with five jurors, it means every single competitor, every single semifinalist of Sphinx receives five pages of jury comments. 
um, which can be extraordinarily um, powerful and informative. Also, Sphinx competitors are required to stay after the initial rounds, even if they do not make it past the semifinals rounds, because that's where master classes, other you know, um, uh, seminars and all of their networking with key members of the Sphinx Symphony and with, with leading artists who we bring in to be role models and mentors, et cetera, because that's where the meat is. And that's why the majority of Sphinx's competitors who don't end up you know, winning the competition have these extraordinary professional career trajectories because of all of that support. So the last thing that I'll say too um, about Sphinx is that it is, in, if you will, not about that. And so when, when I was at the helm uh, prior to the last six years um, and now in its leadership under the past six years under AFA, um, it's not about its leader. It's not about um, the people who lead its various programs. Sphinx is driven by its program participants. Sphinx lead, as I mentioned, that is driven. Um, the architecture for it is in large part driven by the actual participants, the Sphinx leaders who are part of it. Sphinx semifinalists, every single year, their feedback helps to define how it's informed for the future. Sphinx Connect, the giant um, conference that happens every uh, January or early February in Detroit, um, is in large part driven by the thousand people who attend that. And of course, all of the um, sessions are, are, are architected and driven by all of the people who create those sessions um, and, um, and provide the content and, um, and who participates in those. So Sphinx is, and I love this was said in a, in a documentary, but truly is a movement. It is not a, a kind of top-down organization, but it's a movement that is fueled and furthered and evolves through all of those who are really a part of it. Yes, thank you. Um, we have another question um, from Kipras. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, how do you juggle so many aspects of your life portfolio? Do you find sometimes you unintentionally neglect some of them? Such a great question. Thank you so much for that question. You've got me thinking about that. So. My, my initial response is that no, I, I don't. However, I want to preface that um, or, or, or add to that and give context to that, um, which is that um, on the one hand, I never feel overwhelmed. Um, I never feel like something that I'm working on gets short shrift and I can't really do it to the level of quality that I want to. Now, part of the reason for that is that what you see is my portfolio life. If I was to give this presentation next year, that portfolio life will be different. Last year, that portfolio life is different. So in other words, it's always evolving. And sometimes there are absolutely things I'm not able to do or things that I'm doing that I make a decision I have to stop, um, those types of things. So for example, for this past year, there was the film. Um, in large part, that was made possible because of COVID and other things. Do I think I, that there will be a movie that I'll be able to, that I will continually be a filmmaker? I, I don't think so at this point. Um, and I have a different project, uh, a photography project that's underway. Um, so I would say that the reason why I never feel overwhelmed is because I'm constantly architecting, constantly evolving and assessing and making sure I can do what I wanna do. With that said, uh, separate from not feeling overwhelmed, let me be very clear. I don't think anything I do is ever perfect, <laughs> ever. It always needs to be improved on. This presentation wasn't perfect. I dropped off. My technology failed there, I guess, for a second. Very strange, um, uh, which was a first. But um, uh, so I am highly imperfect, um, but I don't. Um, I guess strive, or I, I, I'm not unhappy with my imperfection. I'm always striving to be excellent. And as long as I can come away knowing that I did the best that I could, even if I make a mistake, even if I make an error, even if things were highly imperfect, as long as I prepared the best that I felt I could and delivered the best that I could, um, then I don't have a sense of 
um, kind of negativity. And I also tend not to reflect on that other than for learning. I'm always about what's next. How can I prepare? How can I learn from whatever just happened? So I hope that answers your question because it was such a great question. Um, but that's kind of how I am. But I'm very particular. And sorry, I'll add one last thing, which is that for entrepreneurs, one of the things that we say in entrepreneurship is that the most important decisions that you often will make are the things that you decide not to do, not the things you decide to do. So there is always things just today. Unfortunately, there were two invitations that I received to do very, very interesting things. And unfortunately, I had to say no. Um, so uh, so um, uh, it is very important that you understand what you can't put on your plate because of uh, what you have there. Thank you. That was great. Um, next, we have another question um, from Anthony Brandt. Um, and he asks, what do you need Oh, excuse me. The pandemic has strained the performing arts just at a time when we are also striving for more diversity. What do you think is needed in order to expand opportunities coming out of such a difficult period? Great question, Anthony. And and you know the pandemic has has truly truly um, uh, created many many challenges. However. I would also add that it has created many opportunities. And so how I tend to look at these things is kind of twofold. One, uh, first and foremost, is to just be appreciative. Um, I am so appreciative that, that you know, knocking on wood so far, I haven't had to, to deal with the pandemic personally health-wise. Um, uh, but of course, so many people that all of us know have, and some in very, very, very challenging ways. Um, uh, so first, I'm appreciative uh, and, and understand that sense of, of being lucky. And then that translates into, so what can I do? So I tend not to um, kind of lament about, well, here's all these things and all these job opportunities have gone. All of my, obviously, my, my performances, right, with orchestras, my spoken word performances with orchestras, right, evaporated. So I could kind of sit and just lament and, oh, this is just so terrible. I worked so hard on creating this piece and working to build these, you know, performances. And now, you know, they're all gone and woe is me and so on and so forth. But instead, my focus was, okay, can't do that. Okay, I have to accept that no matter what innovation I bring to bear, I cannot perform with orchestras because there is a pandemic and people aren't, uh, you know, and, and, and halls are shut down and orchestras are shut down. Okay, so what can I do? That led to my film. My film only exists because of COVID. Um, and the opportunities, the entire film was shot on iPhones remotely. Um, the editing work was done, obviously, by editors remotely. Um, so all of that. So in other words, I was able to do that. So if not for the pandemic, I would not have an Emmy Award winning. We won for you know, film festivals, film. Um, so uh, my shows, Arts Engines, 100,000 people you know, tune into this show now every week. Didn't exist before COVID. So, and wouldn't have been possible because people were not as amenable to Zoom type of um, viewing and watching a television show through predominantly Zoom. It does get some broadcast airtime as well, but, um, but it wouldn't have been possible. We couldn't have taped it um, that way. And because we would have had to bring people into a centralized studio, couldn't fly people around the country, cost too much money. So the show was just simply not possible. So I would say that the focus I would encourage you to have in the face of the pandemic and ongoing and Delta variant and all of that is to think first, be appreciative of everything that we have and, um, and the battles we don't have to fight that so many of us do and how can we be helpful and supportive of them? And then how can we further how can we be creative? So if one path is not possible, then how can you create an opportunity? If a particular job opportunity isn't available, how can you try and find and create one? Thank you so much. Um, great, great questions. Yeah, uh, so our uh, we have another question um, from Nova Thomas and she asks, um, what advice do you offer offer to young artists regarding the ability to sustain their passions and abilities to persevere to maintain that connection to source to avoid artistic and creative fatigue. 
And so, sorry, can you read that again? Because I just want to make sure that I fully understand the context of it. Sure. Um, what advice do you offer to young artists regarding the ability to sustain their passions and abilities to persevere to avoid artistic and creative fatigue? Yeah. So, um, so a couple things I would say. So, so first and foremost, I think you have to be passionate about what it is that you do. Um, I don't think getting the dream job is enough motivation to put in the work that's required for most of the best jobs. Um, uh, I think you have to have an underlying passion, a you know something you fall asleep and you wake up that this has to happen. Um, and so for me, and you know, staying up till three o'clock in the morning when I was, because I founded Sphinx when I was still an undergraduate student. First Sphinx happened, and I got my master's after the first Sphinx. Um, uh, and um, and so I was just living and breathing it. So when these things come at us and all of these challenges, I encourage you to find out what that passion is. And if you don't have that passion for what you're doing, I encourage you to potentially see if you need to pivot, if you need to switch gears. Um, the other thing specifically relating to performance is that a lot of times some students will say, oh yeah, I'm going down the practice room, I'm gonna do this and, and so on and so forth because I want that orchestra job, right? With that major orchestra and I'm gonna be the one out of 300 auditionees who get that job. So first, I think it's very important to understand the level of competition that's required. Um, and understand in a very um, authentic way, an honest way, what level is required and where do you currently fall? Not because it's like, okay, here I am, right? So if you can just assume, you know, for any, you know, orchestra job, you probably have, you know, people who are, you know, graduates within the last five years, certainly, right, of the top 10 music schools, right, who are auditioning for that. So you'd have to say, okay, so of those graduates from the past five years, and I take just my school, and I take the, all of the graduates from the past five years for my instrument, where do I measure up against them? Let me multiply that by 10. That's who I'm auditioning with. Will I be selected, right? So you get a sense then of, okay, where you're at. That helps you I think not number one to say, okay, here's where things are at because it helps you know, here's the work I have to put in to truly be competitive for this job that I'm passionate about. Um, and or, okay, here's maybe other things that I want to do so that while you're at school, you can begin architecting what that career path is that you not only want to follow, but that you believe realistically you will be able to achieve. Now here's the second component, which is that I think if you're like, yes, it's got to be. I need to be. My, I need to be part of what that feels like to be part of one of the you know top five orchestras, the feel, and to week in and week out be playing that music, surrounded by the best musicians in the country, right? So now I think you can't go to a practice room and have that be your goal. In my experience. In my experience, those who get those positions are those who go down to the practice room and start working because they're like, I'm going to go and I'm going to play this piece excellently. I'm going to play this excerpt excellently because I know the composer. I know this orchestra. I know how they play it. I am going down to the practice room not to get the job, but to play this as excellently as I can. And my goal is to come out of the practice room with a sense that I did justice to this music. Because if you do that, you will have developed the value, the skill set that that orchestra will want. But that's what I think has to drive you because I think that's what keeps you up there till three o'clock in the morning and gives you the extra amount that makes you play a little bit better, that wins that audition against, yeah, 300 people, you know, 200 of those people really aren't in the running but 100 people generally are, and 50 are really, really close. And of those, you're gonna be the one who's gonna stand out in those top 10. And then there could be some networking or other things that unfortunately, sometimes we feel are unsavory, but also might measure in two, which is why the entrepreneurial skill sets are also important. 
All right, thank you so much. Um, there is a, another question actually from Ms. Jones, uh, and it reads, how does the way that music is consumed shape our efforts for creativity and intentionality? Um, yes. Yeah, so Ms. Ms. Jones, great, great question. Um, and uh, the first thing I would say is, I do not know the answer. If I did, I'd probably be able to be, you know, a multimillionaire or a billionaire um, because the way that music is being consumed is shifting so much. And I would say that no one has really been able to settle on what the model is for music creators moving forward, right? Um, you know, just the models of, of olden times, you, oh, let me do this, get a record contract and, you know, and things will be great and I can make, you know, a hundred grand from a particular recording and so on and so forth, right? So, um, so, uh, so, so I wanna be very honest to say, I don't know. Um, and I would say the people that I see being most successful are those who are being innovative and who are experimenting and who are failing forward, right? They're experiencing some failures and finding stuff out. Um, there are people, and I talk with, with my students, you need very few, relatively speaking, people to find a value in your art. This gets to right, strive not to be a success, but to be a value. If you can demonstrate that your art is of value to 300 people, and those, you know, 300 people are willing to, you know, spend 20 bucks uh, a month, uh, you know, on um, it, to gain the value of your artistry. Um, that's $6,000 a month. That's over seven, 70 grand a year, right? Um, so now all of a sudden you have a basic, you know, nice income, 70 grand a year from 300 people who you have been able to develop, right? A, a small recital hall full of people, but where you bring a value to them. So what is it? Maybe it's the, that model is that you, you know, perform a piece, they get to hear this special piece that you perform just for them every month, right? And how does that come about? Maybe there's initially 50 people you know who will do that, right? Um, so there's different ways to be able to build that. And then of course you can sometimes do something where you able, are able to garner a thousand people or more who really find a value in what you do. And then either you can earn a lot of money or you just are able to find a thousand people who are willing to you know, spend a dollar or $5 on a regular basis, right? That's where you wanna get people, if you will, on a subscription using platforms like Patreon or others. Um, obviously you can do you know, a number of things just simply through social media. But I find that those who are able to make consistent, quote unquote, real money that they can, you know, that they can pay the bills with, it's often a platform like Patreon where they have subscribers and they're building on them and finding what their audience values and are bringing their own creativity to them. All right. Um, and this next question is from Osin. Again, apologies if I, mis if I mispronounce your name. Um, and Osin asks, uh, within this context, um, how can a parent best support a young musician of color who is just beginning their independent professional journey? Uh, wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, so much for that question. Um, so um, first and foremost, uh, 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 I think, and this is something that's very personal for me, is, is unconditional love from your parent. Um, not something I have always experienced. Uh, and so um, I think unconditional love is the most important thing that a parent can um, provide uh, for their child. Um, and, and that not only is actual um, uh, unconditional love, but as perceived by your child, right? Because sometimes as parents, and I'm a parent of two, uh, you know, you, you have this, uh, um, you, can, you can have this sense that, of course I have unconditional love, but they don't feel that way, right? Because they don't do something you want them to do. They get bad grades in school or, you know, they quit the violin, ah, 
right? So, uh, you know, and, and our eldest son ended up going on to business school, uh, just graduated, you know, left music far behind. Um, our youngest uh, did quit the violin, but he's sticking with piano still. Uh, so, you know, 22 and 14 years old. Um, so unconditional love and also that they know that there's unconditional love. Now with that, just to be a little more specific um, and beyond that, I would say um, finding out what are those resources that your child needs. So as a young student of color in music, is it one of the things we found that's one of the most powerful things that Sphinx has been able to provide is a community. Do they feel like they have a sense of community? Are they welcomed into the musical sphere that they are in? And if not, are there things that you can do as a parent to identify that? Obviously for young Black and Latinx musicians, Sphinx is oftentimes that, that community, a very extensive community. Um, uh, there also, I think, are just the resources. So do they have the resources? Is it an instrument? Is it a summer program? Those types of things. So is there something that they can be surrounded in where they'll be able to advance through their you know, musical pursuits and or just learn more about their musical pursuits that would be helpful for them. Um, so those are at least a couple of the types of things. And of course, you know, YouTube videos, you know, things like that. They can find role models, mentors, um, older musicians of color um, who are doing what they want to do. And then they could not only see them, have them be role models, but I models, but I would encourage you to reach out. There's no one that's unreachable. I shared right the Robin Williams story. I was like nobody to you know him. There was no reason it could ever you know want to respond, etc. Um, so uh, I encourage you. It never hurts to try, and that's where that failure comes into play. You know, you just have to assume that you'll have some level of failure. But if you have all of these people and you're seeing YouTube and, and you're reaching out to them as role models and you just keep reaching out, it's inevitable that someone's going to respond to you. So success is inevitable in that case. All right, thank you so much. I think that might be all for our questions. Uh, so with that being said, we are nearing the end of this lecture. And so, um, yeah, Aaron, would you like to send us off with any final thoughts as we wrap up? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Hade. This was great. And, and thank you for a wonderful facilitation and an awesome introduction. Um, and, and it's just been so uh, wonderful to be able to be a part of this. So everyone uh, at Rice and Shepherd, I just so appreciate being welcomed um, into your space and, um, and, uh, and into your lives. And I look forward to keeping in touch. As I mentioned, please do connect with me on social media, uh, et cetera. I absolutely would love uh, to be able to keep in touch. And especially these days where, you know, we feel like there's such disconnect uh, in our world um, I think that would be uh, that would be great. And I absolutely encourage you to at whatever phase you are, make sure you're following your dreams and just know that you can truly architect the career trajectory, the path where you can ultimately find yourself day in and day out living a life that is full of fulfillment where every day you get up and get to do what you love. So thank you so much. And it's just been wonderful to share this time. All right, thank you so much once again to Aaron for just gracing us with your time and energy. And thank you everyone for attending this evening's lecture. Um, as we close, please be on the lookout for our next news event, which will take place on Friday, October 22nd at 7.30 p.m. Central Time, where we will be joined by, by Damar McGill and Anthony Elliott. Um, so everyone, oh, awesome, uh, awesome, awesome people. So, and Tony Damari is of course just amazing and Tony Elliott, one of my biggest mentors. So that should be awesome. Yep. You heard it from the man himself. <laughs> so everyone have a great night and take care. Bye.